Welcome back, Shop Rats. Today, we are revealing the magic. We are pulling back the curtain. No, 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 not like that. We're talking about the Pro Street Dart GTS. Today, we're going to pull back the curtain on how we built the frame rails in the back of that car when we tubbed that car nearly 30 years ago. Let's watch the show intro. We'll see you in about 30 seconds. I'm Mike, and this is my car shop. Working out of a 100 year old refurbished barn, bringing 35 years of experience to projects considered beyond repair. Vision, creativity, and problem solving are the essential tools in this place. Watch as we transform junk into polished metal miracles. This is my car's shop. Just like anything else I have built my entire life. I built it with what I had. I built it with ingenuity. I built it with some engineering, some planning, some foresight, a whole bunch of drawing, which I wished I would have kept all those drawings, um, and did something way outside the box. Now, if you're a longtime viewer on the channel here, none of that's going to surprise you because you know what I do here. We do things differently here at my car shop. But uh, I wanted to kind of prove something to myself. And the main thing I wanted to prove to myself was, can I do it? And I think that is the most important challenge that any of us can take on. Um, I've certainly built plenty of cars where I bought out of the box parts. And uh, as you know, around here, that's not what we do. We do fabrication, we do our own pseudo engineering, if you will, uh, that kind of stuff. So what I wanted to know, what I wanted to do was, can I, narrow a factory unibody car, make it a pro street car, and be successful at it without taking a fairly rare collectible original GTS that was admittedly in fairly tough shape and turning it into a pile of scrap metal. So in order to explain to you how I built this, uh, it's gonna be pretty tough without a hoist to really get you under there and let you see things. We're definitely going to take you under there but the first thing I want to do is take you over to the whiteboard and kind of share my philosophy of what I was experiencing and thinking in order to make this happen. I just realized I have notes up here about stuff that needs to happen for the Oakland. So I'm going to work around that because I don't want to forget that stuff. So again, my question was, can I narrow a factory unibody car? Well, obviously that's been done for uh, since 2000. Well, I bought the car in... 1993, right before my daughter was born. I didn't start working on it right away. Uh, I narrowed and tubbed it somewhere around 95 and had to finish it up to get it onto a car trailer to haul it to Wisconsin because I accepted a position working in engineering at Mercury Marine. So we needed to be able to move the car. That part was done. The unibody, the all the narrowing was done at that point. But there was some things that were missing. So let's talk about the way I did it. Okay, so we have two unibody frame rails. Okay, they look something like this. We're not going to make it real fancy here, okay? Just to give you the idea of unibody frame rails. And of course, on a Mopar, the leaf springs are mounted on the outside of the frame rail to a plate, and there's a unit frame member that comes over, etc., etc. My question was, what happens if I took these two frame rails and moved them together uh, 18 inches, 9 inches per side. Now I didn't move the frame rails completely that much. The first thing I did 
well, <laughs> not first thing, but the first thing I decided to do was do the typical relocate the leaf springs under the frame. So that gives you an extra three inches, I think it is. So that, uh, in order to fit those 1850 tires under there, that meant I would only have to narrow the frame uh, six inches, move the frame rail in about six inches with those leaf springs moved inboard. Of course, that meant I had to make some great big wide tubs and that kind of stuff, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The second thing I wanted was a back seat because my kids were young and I wanted my kids to be able to ride in the car. You've heard me say that many times before. The third thing was I kind of wanted to stick with the Mopar factory leaf spring setup. Why? Because I had it. It's cheap. I did look at an S&W race car, four link rear, rear clip, blah, blah, blah. I would have lost the back seat. I looked at an S&W kit with ladder bars, coilovers. I would have lost the back seat. The back seat was important. I didn't want to spend several thousand dollars for the kit. Use what you got. You've got factory frame rails. You've got the leaf springs. Let's make it work. I went through and I cut out all the frame members, everything from about here, which is where these frame rails come in underneath the rear seat. I cut everything out of the car with a plasma cutter. Then I took a piece of two by three box tube and welded it inside the car back here. And I took a piece of two by six, I think it was two by six box tube and welded it between the car up here. So now I built a box. Then, and you'll see this under the car, I took the frame rails, pardon me for this not being very uh, true to scale, I took the frame rails and I made it so that the top of the frame rail would lie right here on the top of this box tube, and then I cut the frame down like this, and if this is our, ah, I did that wrong, if this is our frame rail, like so, it also came back here and weld it up to this, okay? This is not very accurate, but get the idea. So there was a lip here, then it came down, then it was also cut out because I made a big, huge steel box down here for the leaf spring to go into. So let's take you under the car so you can see that. I did that on both sides, lots of dimensioning, lots of squaring, lots of, lots of, lots of. Uh, and we'll show you what I did. Um, this box tube was across there for a long time until I went to put the drive shaft in. And I cut this open like this and put kind of a rear drive shaft loop in, which is opposite of what you need for drag racing. But what the heck? Why not, right? My kids are going to be sitting back here. I don't want a drive shaft coming through the floor. So I specifically made a box back there. I think I had a 2 by 2 tubing uh, as well for that. So there's our factory frame rail with the springs put in. I just used the uh, factory spring perch, notched the frame, welded that in. Made my own shock mounts out of a piece of angle iron there. You can kind of see that. Um, stuff like that. So let's see if I can get you up there and see how I did the front spring mount. Sorry, everything's so dirty. You can kind of see the, uh, the box that I built there. Uh, oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, so I laid, this is a piece of two by three box tube here that I laid and welded to that um, piece of, I think it's four by six, or uh, two by two by four, two by six, two by six uh, box tube right there that came across. That was one solid piece until I made that rear drive shaft loop. Um, but I laid a piece uh, on there. I jigged it up with a square and I welded it to that uh, two by six piece. Then I laid my frame rail, if you can see that, on top of that and welded it solid to that uh, piece of box tube. I did the same thing on the other side. And then I made this, uh, it's, uh, I think it's quarter inch plate um, box to put the leaf springs in. Now that may seem a little overkill, but the reason was because at the time I was designing a set of Caltrax type bars. I hadn't ever seen Caltrax bars before, and I was designing my own set um, to make my own, uh, it was actually going to be a three-link type of traction control device that I was building. And uh, as I was in the process of building this car, I discovered Caltrax bars and realized I didn't need to do that. And so I wanted this in here to be extra strong uh, to handle the torque of all of that. So once I got far enough along, I then chopped out the middle of that a two by six piece of box tube that went across there and I built this custom 
rear drive shaft loop and I had to C notch it down on the bottom to allow clearance because the drive shaft was a little bit lower uh, than I wanted it to be. Um, so I built that like that. Let's take you to the back here and I'll show you how I tied this into the back of the car. So you can see that where I cut the frame rail off right there and I just nestled this piece of two by three box tube right in there and literally just welded the unibody frame rail solid to that. Now there's a couple interesting things about this engineering feat that I did here. Um, I didn't know a whole lot about unibody construction at the time, so let me share a couple stories with you. In 1995, when I started building this car, I was 29 years old. I didn't know a whole lot. I had been working in engineering for quite a while. Uh, I had been a certified mechanic for quite a while. Uh, but there was more that I didn't know about chassis construction and so forth than I did know. So part of this took me a while because I had to spend a lot of time uh, studying, researching, understanding chassis, understanding how four links worked, understanding how ladder bars worked, etc., etc. Uh, I wasn't totally convinced this was going to be strong enough, uh, but I was quite surprised. Before I even put the wheel tubs in, and I made those myself, and I made them box with the quarter panel so that they're uh, nice and strong. But before I did that, when I had the frame back in the car, before I even had the roll bar in the car, uh, I took it out and drove it. I had the, the first 360 in it that, uh, that I built for this car. And I took it out and drove it around. Uh, with I, I was sitting on a milk crate, and my son was with me. He was sitting on a milk crate, which I shake my head about now. That Sorry, Joe, that was really dumb of me to do. But I, was, I just didn't. You know, I felt like it was going to be safe. Now it gives me, it gives me the willies. But anyway, and we went ripping around the factory parking lot where I worked, and I was curious to know how strong the chassis was going to be without the roll cage, and uh, without the wheel tubs. And it was, it was quite surprising. There was very little flex in this body, even without all that in there. Uh, so once I was satisfied that I wasn't going to twist this thing into a big pretzel, I went back, uh, put the wheel tubs in it put the uh, roll cage in it and really stiffened everything up, of course, to what it is today. I will say this, please don't drive a car around without wheel tubs in it. Not a good idea for many, many reasons. So I'm, I try to be pretty transparent with you. I was young, I was dumb, uh, was not the smartest move. I certainly don't deserve Father of the Year for that one. Before the tubs and the roll cage were completed, the car did sit for quite a while. I kind of lost interest in the project. Uh, I tried to sell it. I couldn't get anybody to bite on it. I think the work that I had done on it, because it was kind of, I'm not saying I'm the only one that's ever done this. I'm the only one that I know that's ever done it. Uh, I think that kind of scared people off a little bit. Um, but we didn't buckle the roof. We didn't buckle quarter panels. You know, everything turned out just fine. So that was cool. Actually, I did have part of the tubs in. Now that I think about it, I had the tubs in from, from down here up to about here. I didn't have the front of the tubs done yet uh, for whatever reason. I don't remember. So when we drove it around, the tires were definitely exposed, but part of the tubs were in the car. Uh, I do remember that. But it was still a very dangerous scenario with no seats in the car. And ugh, Anyway. I'm going to try to get over that one. Nobody got killed. Nobody lost an eye. Nobody got hurt. Um, everything is fine. Um, but probably my son has been in therapy over that experience and he just hasn't, he's been too gracious to tell me. <laughs> the one thing, if you were observant when you were under the car, you'll notice is this has just slapper bars on it. Um, I know, not the recommended thing on a Mopar at all. Those are more for GM style leaf springs, blah, blah, blah. I know all that, okay? I know all that. Um, but my concern was I didn't have anything on this car to prevent axle wind up until I got that the traction control device built that I wanted to put on the car. There's no pinions number on this at all the way I made this. I could have engineered one in there. At that time I didn't understand the function of a pinions number like I do now. Um, so I might have built it a little differently. But again it was designed with a, I'll call it a Caltrax bar of my own design even though I hadn't heard of that again when I first started building it. I was working with uh, a leverage type of traction control device that very similar to what Caltrax. Uh, but this was one of my own creation and my own design. So it does have those traction bars on there. Quite frankly, for what I do with the car, I don't race it. Uh, I'm, I will eventually run this car down the track at some point. I may make a decision to go ahead and actually put the Caltrax bars on it. Um, 
but for what I do with the car as a driver, uh, basically just rip around, do burnouts and so forth. The car actually hooks really well if I want it to, um, but it does spin the tires really hard if I want it to also, so I kind of hate to mess with it. I, I kind of like it just the way it is. I've repeated the specs on what's in the back end of this before, but I'll say it again for those who haven't seen the other episodes on it, which there are a bunch, so go check out the playlist on this car. It's got an 8 3 quarter Mopar in it with a spool. I drive it on the street. It's got a 457 gear in it. It is a 489K, so it's the big pinion. Uh, nothing fancy. It's got uh, the, the rear axle. I haven't said this before. The rear axle, I bought it just the way it is. It was already narrowed. It was out of a different car. And it actually has Oldsmobile axle housing ends on it. Apparently, that's a common thing for maybe putting disc brakes on the back. I don't know, it doesn't matter. Rather than chopping those off, I left them. I made my own aluminum adapters to adapt Mopar. Uh, I think they're 10 inch, 10 by three, 10 by two and a half, 10 by three. I think they're three inch wide. Mopar brakes on the back and good to go. Um, the axles, of course, were, um, they're narrowed, remachined, C-body axles. There was nothing fancy in the axles either. I always intended to put a set of Mosiers in it, but haven't needed to. This car has been on the road since 2000, um, off and on, of course. It's been off the road a bit, but I, I beat the crap out of this car. It's on its second motor and transmission. You know, in 22 years, uh, I have not been an axle yet. Of course, I'm not hooking it at the track with a trans brake, you know, but for what I do with it, uh, again, it was built to be a street car. I think it functions pretty well. For those that want to know, the roll cage was, or it's a roll bar, roll cage, whatever, was purchased from Jags. I think it was a Jags brand, nothing fancy. Uh, it has subframe connectors in it that I made out of 2x3 box tube. If you want to see how I did that, go look at the Stitches Challenger. I did this one exactly the same way that I did those over there on that car 50 episodes or so. Episodes ago or so. Say that four times real fast. But the old GTS, she gets with the program pretty good. And uh, I was thinking about taking it out, trying to do a burnout with it. Becky's not here to run the camera, and I'm getting pressed for time, so we're not going to be able to do that today. I'm sorry. I'll try to remember to insert some older burnout footage here for you, at least so those of you who haven't seen this thing go um, can see that. Well, I really appreciate you being here. I appreciate the inquiry. It was actually Duddy from over at Duddy's Adventures. If you haven't seen him, check him out. Tell him that Mike from My Car Shop sent you. He'd well know who the hell you're talking about, and it's good to get the word out. He had asked these questions, and I thought, hey, today's a great day for me to uh, address those questions, put this car in, the weather's decent, and uh, get this done while this car is still out before I put it away for the winter, which is going to be in another few weeks. On the face thing, on Instagram, forward slash my car shop, or here on the you thing, like, subscribe. You know, the biggest thing people say, how can we support your channel? And I don't really ask for anything, even though you guys, you send me money, you send me parts, you send me all kind of stuff. And I'm just always blown away at your generosity and your support in everything we have going on here at My Car Shop. The one thing that I would ask you to do, please, share the videos with people. Um, send them to your friends, send them to your enemies. Any groups that you are in on social media, if the project that I happen to be working on in that episode is applicable, please share the video. Get the word out, help the channel to grow. The more the channel grows, the more I'm going to be able to do uh, as we increase the revenue here. Um, that allows me to just invest more and more money into what we're doing here on the channel. And I really, really, really appreciate that. So thanks much. <laughs>